Hi, welcome to The Believe Show. I'm Senya Maiman, and I'm here with Ryan Wisnett. So good to see you. Hi, Ryan. Hi, thanks for having me. It's really good to be here. I'm so glad you're on because this is a topic that we we have not had anybody come on to speak about in over about 200 episodes. So I'm thrilled that we're we're playing it out with you. I'm, yeah, I'm really happy to speak about it. So before we start, let me tell everybody a little bit about you. This is Ryan Wisnett, and he is a strategist, a sustainability author, and a certified positive psychology coach working at the intersection of business and regenerative systems change. Uh, Ryan's work has ranged from leading immersive wilderness experiences, I'm sure we'll talk about that, to corporate sustainability in New York City, to international ocean conservation in Asia, and to currently leading a collabor collaborative of some of the world's biggest companies and environmental nonprofits working together on regenerative agriculture in the Midwest. Hi, Ryan. Hi. I'm also going to put up your website so that people can find out a little bit more about you anytime they want. So to start, what is it, let me grab that, what is it that you believe to be true that others may not agree with you about? This is such an interesting question when you posed it to me. Uh, and this is, I, I had a pretty immediate answer uh, and it came from my experience when I really first started to study positive psychology. Uh, and I, and I, was building on a, a several years of, of, kind of wilderness based nature experience and realized that nature connection is really a fundamentally important component of and really powerful intervention for well being. Um, I would even contend maybe sort of the, you could call it the prime intervention. Um, and I don't know that everyone uh, in the field of positive psychology necessarily would agree with me because when I when I really started to dig into it, I saw traces of it everywhere, but not really anything explicitly about its role. Can you tell us a little what you mean by nature connection? Yeah, so there is uh, obviously the, you know a body of, of research about this, um, you know, the kind of couched in positive uh, or sorry, environmental psychology. Um, and the and the benefits from that perspective. Um, but you know, when I think about nature connection, I really think about it from it's a very personal thing uh, for for everybody. And some of the connection that I initially felt um, when I was uh, when I was young, when I was a kid, uh, and started to get uh, more of a relationship, a direct relationship. And at first, it was just running out into the patch of woods behind my house uh, where I was living in the suburban uh, Twin Cities area in Minnesota. And uh, eventually that led me to trips into the back country in the, the boundary waters of uh, northern Minnesota. And that eventually led to me wanting to go deeper in my studies of it and uh, went to a few different schools, uh, which I can say a bit more about it, um, later on in the conversation, but where they've really developed some structured ways to engage in nature um, and start to really develop relationship with the birds and the animals and the plants and the, all of the elements, um, you know, the, the wind and the sun um, and actually having the same kind of relationship with those things that you would have with uh, another person. Uh, and that, I think, for me, is a, a different way of uh, thinking about nature connection. I think the research can help to inform it, but it's about that personal relationship that you have. So you're saying, yes, lots of concepts in positive psychology are very important. But your argument is that actually maybe the primary is our relationship and our connection to nature. Yeah, and that's the thing. Uh, you know, I think the the PERMA model, um, which I got introduced to when I started to study this, was really useful for me because I started to look at the different elements of PERMA. Uh, and I again, I didn't necessarily see nature connection, um, time in nature called out explicitly, but I could see it, it, it was all over. The perma model. When you look at um, you know different practices, mindfulness, gratitude, um, things like awe, curiosity, uh, you know nature is written all over them. What what a fun idea! Can you tell us a little more about uh, creating your own relationship with nature, just like you would with another person? I'm I'm really fascinated by you saying that. Yeah, well, and I, I would say. Um, you know, one of the, the foundational uh, routines or practices that anybody can implement um, wherever you are that can that can start to establish some of that connection is uh, something that I learned um, from one of the schools that I went to called uh, Wilderness Awareness School, which is based out in Western Washington. Um, and they there's a there's in person uh, courses that are available. There's also um, some kind of remote study courses that they um, that they've created one um, called Kamana, which is um, really, really beneficial. And the core routine for Kamana is something called the sit spot. 
Uh, and the sit spot, it's, it's, you know, things can sometimes, the power of them can get lost in the simplicity, but it's really simply just finding a place in nature and going there every day, whether it's for 10 minutes or an hour through all the times of day, you know, I, I've spent overnights at my sit spot all the times of the year, seeing the turn of the seasons. And you start to know that place as intimately as you know your your family. Um, and it starts to respond to you in a different way. And you, you know, what we don't have the same kind of relationship with nature oftentimes because uh, as we're heading out into natural settings, um, we're not really in a kind of centered place that allows uh, nature to sort of uh, take us in and, and, and accept us. Everything flees from us oftentimes because um, of the things we have going on in our heads, you know, the stress that, that we're, we're giving off from our bodies. When you start to spend time in a sit spot, um, it brings you back down to baseline and you start to have experiences. Uh, and, you know, the sit spot that I went to, I, I, you know, I started to have birds landing right next to my head. I had a coyote walk right in front of me. didn't even realize I was sitting there until it smelled me on the, the bushes that I had just come through. Um, hawks hunting in the field right in front of me. Uh, you start to actually become a, a part of nature rather than being separate from it. How long do you need to sit there in order for these experiences to happen? Well, I mean, there's no uh, kind of set time. Um, but, you know, I think I had been sitting at my, as visiting my sit spot regularly for probably a year before I started to have these experiences. But the thing that'll trip people up oftentimes is they, they have some uh, idea that nature is, is sort of big nature. I need to get out to a mountaintop or, you know, some majestic river in the middle of nowhere. That That's that's actually one of the biggest barriers for people building nature connection. Um, it is, you know, even if you're in New York City, you can go out to Madison Square Park. I, I remember actually when I was taking my positive psychology course in Manhattan, mm -hmm. uh, went on a lunch break down to Madison Square Park and there was a red-tailed hawk sitting uh, in there in a tree. So nature is is right there and it's accessible. And the most important thing is to make it accessible for you. So walking out your back door, being able to sit down, if it's if it's convenient, you'll do it. And that's what's going to start to make the difference. So you're suggesting that people choose a spot in nature, something that's accessible to them. It may be a part of their backyard and they revisit that spot every day for 10 minutes. Yeah. I mean, it could be even if it's two minutes, it's, you know, it's getting that repetition and the regularity, but it's also, it's, I mean, the, the fundamental practice is, is to go there, but it's also about going there and seeing differently, um, in, you know, using your eyes, using your awareness in a different way. And there's a series in, in Kamana, there's a series of exercises that, that, that you build on where you will actually start journaling when you return from your sit spot and you'll you'll draw maps of what you encountered while you were there so you're kind of dragging the experience back through your brain in a different way and it actually starts to train your your it's, it's brain building all of this is brain building um and you will you'll actually start to create um mental index cards essentially of mm -hmm. animals and trees because there's there's actually a a parallel uh, study of field guides so, you know, you're, you'll be learning your mammals and your birds and your trees while you're out at your sit spot. And I had experiences where I would pass a particular plant that I had never seen before. I'd had no experience and the name of it would just pop into my head. I had no idea why. And I'd realized that there was a journal that I had done about it months before. And you start to build that way of seeing. And the beautiful thing about it is you do that anchored in a particular place but when you train yourself to see in that way you take that with you wherever you go and this idea just go to that place at the same time 1 p.m same time every day or is it not i i would actually recommend through all different times of day through different times of the year because then you start to to learn the cycles mm -hmm. you know things are very different if you um you know, typically um, animals are going to be more active around 8 a.m., 8 p.m., dawn and dusk. So you might see a lot more activity. I mean, it all depends on the climate, the bioregion that you're in. But if you're out there in the, you know, blazing sun in the middle of the afternoon in the summer, there's not going to be much activity going on. But there's going to be other things that you're going to realize. So you arrive at this spot, let's say it's in someone's backyard, and you find a spot of grass or a spot of soil, and you sit there mm -hmm. for, for about 10 minutes. Yeah, 10 minutes or or an hour, if you know, if you have the time, what you'll find is as you start to develop that relationship with place, you'll want to spend more time there. Can you bring another person there? Or does that defeat the purpose? 
that I would say defeats the purpose. Yeah, because yeah. part of part of what you're trying to do is um, develop, you know, develop the relationship with the place. Um, yeah. And if you have another person with you, there's sort of a, a draw to that the person um, rather than just being. And and, and you know, to your point, a piece of grab, you know, spot of grass or a spot of dirt. That's your called your anchor point, and that's where you sit every time. And you you know, there's exploration that you would do. Um, the, the broader sit spot area is about 200 paces across and you learn that patch of nature like the back of your hand you know where animals animals are moving through and um you know what what the plants are doing through the seasons but you're always anchoring on that the center spot where you sit and do you bring something to write notes down in do you observe do you yep. uh, do you you're try just you're observing you're seeing yep yeah you're and that's that part of why this is a fundamental practice is it you know it's it's a form of meditation in a way. Um, but it's even even many meditation practices, you're still doing something. You're there's an act of meditating. Mm -hmm. And this is just you at your sit spot just being. Yeah. Just, just being present. I, I, I love your analogy of just how it's uh, we walk through a lot of nature. So when I go hiking, I just go there and back up the hill wherever it is, but I pass through that place. And if I think about my relationships with people, I have strong, repetitive, connected interaction mm -hmm. so what you're describing to me is just a completely different way of thinking about here's a spot i'm getting to know the spot and all around it. it it does it has to build a deeper connection because you're not just going through like on a hike and there's a whole hidden world anytime you're passing through nature in any in any way you can think of it in terms of there's essentially kind of rings of disturbance that you're giving off as you're moving through the landscape and then you also have there's a ring of awareness that you have that of, of what's going on around you. And most people on average, let's just say you're heading out from the city and you've you know, just got done with working and it's a Friday and you're still thinking about the week. Your ring of disturbance is pretty significant and your ring of awareness is, is, is collapsed because you're in your head and you're thinking. And the part of the game is to flip that. And as soon as you start to have a larger ring of awareness than your ring of disturbance, a whole world opens up to you and you start to see things that were right there the whole time that you never really got to see. It's, it's so interesting you mentioned this. One of the people we're having on the show next week uh, is a professor. And when she professes, she is very big, but she also works with training her horses. And she says she can never go to her horses after she teaches because they, they're, they're prey, they go away. They can feel it. So your ring of disturbance, ring of awareness, really rings true for me and also flipping that how can i be more aware but less <laughs> sending off waves and there there is a really useful teaching uh, about the birds um in some of the mythology you know it said that the everything kind of had <clears throat> had its instructions at the beginning of time for for the role that it would play and, and part of the role of the birds is to help lift man's troubled mind and the way that that expresses itself is when you go out into nature or even your front yard, pay attention to the birds and the birds will reflect back to you your, your state. Um, and I, it, it, against the backdrop of your sit spot area where you, you have more of a kind of uh, a baseline to work against, you'll notice it more. But this is anywhere. The birds will flee from you. Some of them will even kind of like call at you, alarm at you because of the the energy that you're giving off. And so it's a great kind of barometer for us. If we just pay attention to the birds, it can reflect back to us sort of the, the state that we're in. So interesting. I, I've been in a situation of uh, horse training for leadership. So I know what you mean by that too, just how animals react, but I never thought of paying attention to what's around us all the time, birds, uh, either around or not around us, depending. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, well, we started by saying that there are hidden benefits of nature connection. What are some of these benefits, whether it's the sit spot exercise or other ways? Well, the yeah, I mean, I, I think um, talking about the sit spot exercise, it's, it's definitely um, one of just presence, building presence and, and awareness. Um, a couple other that I'd mentioned uh, before, I mean, we, we, I think anybody who's studied any positive psychology knows the benefits of curiosity. And one of the core practices of, of this kind of work, you call it that in terms of building nature connection is tracking. Um, and most people, when they think of tracking, they think of, of footprints on the ground. Um, but there's a much more expansive way to think about that and think consider that everything leaves tracks. 
you know, whether it's a car going down the road or a storm system moving through a particular area or even a, a bird. Um, it's the same concept of rings of disturbance. There's these concentric rings that everything is giving off all the time. And you can start to, to read those. And the amazing thing about tracking is you, you can come upon a set of tracks. Um, I'm thinking about uh, some tracking I did out in the, uh, there's a dunes area in, in Oregon. Um, amazing. It's like a giant sandbox that goes on for miles. Um, and there was some porcupines that had left some tracks. And we never saw the porcupines, but there was a whole story there that was laid out in the sand for us. And there had been two males that had come together and they got in a fight and there was a bunch of, of their needles, every their, their, their quills everywhere. And then they'd gone off in separate directions. And if you learn to see it, it's, it's there, there's a language there. And it's the ultimate expression of curiosity because really what, you know, the, the, what tracking is, it's not just footprints on the ground, it's asking the question, what happened here? And it leads to the next thing and it leads to the next. And there's, there's always something at the end of that trail. Yeah. And so it's just, it's this never ending mystery. So it, it, and it kind of, you know, connects to some bigger things about just the mystery of, of life through tracks. Uh, what's for yourself one of the most interesting for yourself experiences that you've had in nature? Oh, it's a long list. Um, I would say, well, I know what's most interesting, but the one that popped into my head was when I was uh, I was in in this program uh, in Western Washington in the foothills of the Cascades, and um, I'd felt this. Um, real affinity for mountain lions that because I'd never lived in an area that had mountain lions and I'd, I'd been studying them. And I still remember the first time we were down by this pond that was on the land where we, where we met and um, came upon our first mountain lion track. And that was just perfect, beautiful, huge cat track in the mud. Um, and just the, the experience of immediate aliveness of, you know, there could be a mountain lion like, 15 feet away that just came through and we didn't even realize it. Um, so that was just th that, that, you know, when you think about the relationship, um, I, I think that's part of what this um, I, whole notion of nature connection means. It's just a, a connection to that feeling of aliveness. Um, yeah. And it was through just through this, it was, and it was just one, I was not, and I still am not anything close to an expert tracker. Um, there are some incredible trackers out there. Um, so this was just a single, print that I could find, but that single print just opened up this whole world of, of feeling alive in that moment. Aliveness. That's so neat how you describe it. How do you use this in teaching other people about it or in coaching? How do you use these ideas of nature? It's a great question. Um, and it's not a, there's not an easy answer. Cause I, I mean, there are certainly instances where I've, I've, been involved in sort of nature focused programs or coaching where it's just kind of explicitly part of what I'm doing. Um, mm -hmm. But I can't not bring this in to the coaching that I do. Um, and you have to have people, it's nothing that you would, you can kind of force people into, um, you know, if people aren't ready to go sit in the woods. They're not going to, and they're not going to get the benefits from it. Um, but I think that there are there are subtle ways to introduce it to people, and 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 actually, I mean, part of what I've introduced in this conversation is some of those ways is just saying, you know, even if it's just step out on your porch, you know, maybe you're not even going and sitting, but take that moment and pause, and actually, um, you know, sort of if you think about the way a cat goes out at you know if it's going out at night, it sort of it pauses on the front step and looks and and sniffs the air, you know, there's a moment of, of taking everything in just when, when there are openings to kind of bring those sorts of practices in um, and connecting it to the things, the hooks that people already have. Maybe there's, maybe they had, they feel some affinity to gardening, or maybe they have, you know, they've gone fishing when they're younger and they have good memories with, you know, fishing with their parent or the, the part, part of it is really seeing what speaks to each person in nature and finding a way to kind of hook um, and, and introduce some of these benefits to them. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, thank you so much. Uh, I always have two questions that I end with, but thank you so much. You opened my eyes to this. And one of the reasons that I asked about bringing others is I'm thinking, well, can I tell my kids, but I'll send them off on their own. I won't, I won't go with them. So thank you. Uh, my last two questions. For the people who have been with us today, 
what is a thought that you would like to leave everybody with? Well, I mean, I would summarize what we were talking about with the sit spot and just say, if you have any nature and everybody has some nature near them, find the time, particularly in this, you know, these, this moment, this strange moment that we're all in where we've been, a lot of us have been cooped up indoors, but find the time to get out, spend, you know, a minute in nature every day. Uh, if everybody did that, it could change the world. And uh, to come back to one other thing you said before, you're saying in the PERMA model, all of those things apply to nature. So is that right? You're saying positive emotions, you can have them in nature. You can feel in flow. You can have relationship with nature, which is what you're talking about. You can feel yeah. meaning when you're there. And achievement, how do you feel achievement with nature? Uh, that one, without you know getting into it too much, I mean, there's examples of, uh, the one that I always like to talk about is, um, you know, we've talked about tracking, there's other skills, uh, survival skills, and one is making fire without matches. And the first time that somebody makes a bow drill fire and they actually create fire themselves without any modern tools, it, it, it's like something flips on inside of them and the, the sense of achievement and, and a feeling of resilience and confidence. Um, I've never found anything else like that. What a cool example. And my last question, if you could snap your fingers and almost everyone in the world were to take some action, what action would you want that to be? Well, it would be back to this idea of everybody spending a little bit of time in nature, but I think to get more specific, I would say, I would love to see positive psychology um, researchers and particularly practitioners more explicitly bring nature into the discussion about the kinds of interventions that are beneficial. Um, you know, it, it, as we've talked about, there are elements of this throughout models like PERMA, but I would love to see more talk about how nature can be and, you know, really should be a fundamental intervention for, for positive psychology and well being. I hope that, like you say, that people follow it. I love what you're saying. Thank you so much for all of this. Thank you. Thank you. We've been here with Ryan Wisnett, and I am about to say goodbye to you, and we'll see you next time.